Hello, everyone. Today we were supposed to have an online class. Something went wrong. So we didn't have an online class, but we did have an on-campus class. And I will here summarize a few discussions, if I recall them all, and that happened on campus. And hopefully some of you will find it helpful. So all of you got uh, the email from me yesterday and here's um, a picture from the experiment that I wanted to share with you yesterday and it's a very famous experiment and it's quite interesting what it does say that our own perceptions not just of the world but also of our own bodies are not as natural and not as uh, clean cut as we might want to believe because and in fact what the experiment actually shows that what we perceive, even when it comes to our own body, is actually an outcome of our interactions with the world. It is not as natural as one would think. If you think about it in, in, in broader terms, a bit more abstractly, you would actually think in, you knew it all the time because when we interact with our closest family members, they become part of us and we sympathize or empathize for them more than, say, for a person who is now in Africa or on, in Chile. Right? So that's, that's, that's actually starts making sense when we put it um, in that context. Nevertheless, the reason why I included this experiment is to sh share with you the following consideration. Since, since the way we feel and the way we shape, we are shaped, it depends on our interactions in schools, the kinds of interactions we create and the, um, the expansiveness, the, 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 their scope, what we, whom we validate through these interactions and whom we dis and disfranchise are really, really important. And the argument that I suggested to you yesterday and here is on the slide is as follows. Schools are places where racial and cultural segregation is taught. It's, it is taught because we do things that are, seem to us so natural and yet they actually, through our actions, we disfranchise entire cultures, including the students we have very much in front of us. And some of us would think, well, what's wrong with Dr. Seuss, Anya? What's wrong with Dr. Seuss? Why can't we just today do Dr. Seuss in class? It's not Dr. Seuss. It's the way we got the students to do Dr. Seuss. Because... And did we have any other alternatives? Did we have any other choices? And are you yourselves aware that there are choices? And on what forms of knowledge do you actually choose the kinds of texts that you do with students? And I know that some of them are in the school curricula, but even those school curricula are not the Bible. One can actually reflect, expand, and the principal would be very happy, especially since this kind of way of uh, teaching is now aligning with the curriculum and um, the policies of Australia. So this sort of silent process um, of, of teaching racial and cultural segregation Sociologists refer to it as symbolic violence, and I quite like it because through symbols we violate other people's beliefs, we make them feel irrelevant, we make them feel that it's our, our way or no other way. That's why in um, lecture, in, in, in our lectures, I was when we were talking about designing units of work. I emphasize that from the word go, as you enter the class and your unit of work starts, all students, this, you, you've got to know your students, you've got to know the different backgrounds they have. It is not about classifying them and um, putting them in drawers, but actually to do what, uh, what is his name, this guy, Mr. Bean, did when he was producing his sketch. You've got to know your audience and you need to engage them on their terms. So that when you actually enter the class, it's very important that the kinds of symbols you use, the kinds of symbols in relation to which you draw connections with the students, that they are not reflecting just one culture, one way of seeing and one way of being. Because then what we do instantly, we tell students from other, um, let's call it cultures, we tell them we're here in, uh, f for one purpose only, which is to become the way 
that we are and what they are might be relevant now and then because we have thoughtful people and now and then we'll ask them for an opinion but really that's just only an opinion and that's another misunderstanding really of what perspectives in the course in the context of literacy actually are they're not perspectives they are knots that we connect we assemble in order to create new more refreshing more interesting um entities Right, so if a culture is actually locked on itself, then it can't look outside. And when it doesn't look outside, it basically runs in a circle. But that's why we have diversity in classroom. And that's why we have, we need to actually engage the diversity in order for our students to develop new richer things, rich, richer connections in order to produce a more interesting uh, texts. Okay, so including symbols that our students relate to and then enabling students to work with these symbols, to interact with these symbols, to interrogate these symbols and in ways that actually makes a, make a difference to the outcome of the whole process, that's critical. And I just to make it a bit more even clear, I will come back to this point and I might delete this and I would like you to once again, and I'm very sorry to do it to you, but once again, I want us to look at these definitions of these uh, brief summaries of the capabilities, of the general capabilities that I produce to actually make your life easier. So the social and personal capabilities concern themselves largely with the student's knowledge of themselves and of their interlocutors, right? So just like you, you have to know your students and, and then as in the process also you learn about yourself as well. But anyway, just let's stick to the students now. So the social and, and, and personal capabilities concern themselves with the kinds of opportunities you create for students in order for them to better understand their audience, the people with whom they are interacting, they're producing information for, right? And we've discussed it many times, so, for, so I might just take it step by step. If those opportunities that you will create for them to learn about their interlocutors and therefore as a result those, that knowledge will impact on how they actually see themselves, so if those opportunities draw on sources, which is in here, on sources which are monolingual, monocultural, so it's about, you know, um, Vietnamese people are like this or English, and there is no actually uh, inclusion of the perspectives from others, then it is likely that our students will think of their interlocutors in a quite narrow way. So it's important that they know their interlocutors, but it's also important what kinds of sources of information you make available for them to actually learn from. That's why I stress the presence of a cultural officer. Every school pays a person money who is an indigenous officer or a cultural officer and these people connect teachers with the community and community is bigger than just parents. So Google is great for enriching the kinds of materials on the basis of which children learn about the audiences and that could be even their own peers. But their own peers, in order to get any information about their own peers, they, don't, they, they will not get quality information just from the peers alone. It's actually good to do some research about their cultures and contexts. So those sources need to be quite uh, thoughtfully chosen. And now depends how, depending on, uh, I, I might just uh, color this, uh, I, this, this particular um, points that I actually am interested in stressing in here. So right, so children should know themselves and their, interlo in their interlocutors. Now this, how they will actually, the, the way they will actually approach themselves and others will depends, depend on the kinds of sources 
on, on the basis of which the materials in classroom are actually based, right? I'm oh, sorry for good English, but you know what I'm saying. The sources in relation to which students construct this knowledge is important. And now also, the kinds of materials you make available will also reflect on the on the on the image of the community that your teaching actually projects. So if students build an understanding of the of their interlocutors and therefore of themselves on the by on the narrow on the on the narrow basis or on the kinds of sources which are actually produced by one single culture or by not not very diverse and not very interesting and expensive, then the image of the community they will actually build is that what? We all speak English, English is all that matters, Dr. Seuss matters, we really don't even learn any alphabets, we don't even really need to know about other alphabets, we don't need to know anything other, they, you know, this is our community, this is us, this is, this is us, yeah, we are like that, right? And even though I'm a little bit here, um, uh, I, uh, sarcastic or ironic, in fact, a lot of people still think this way. May, hopefully they are an old generation, um, but it, we need to be quite wary of that. So now when we actually look at the design of, uh, of someone's uh, unit of work, and I just look at the first lesson, why am I looking at the first lesson? Because I don't have time to actually check five lessons. But what I do look at is the way in which, say, the specific specific, what will we call them, those um, learning outcomes, like say this one, how they are actually related to capabilities, which means the kind of resource, the sources of information in relation to which students are learning about themselves and others, and therefore the acquiring a specific image of the community in which they live, right? So I want to know how these units of where, of how these outcomes relate to capabilities and therefore to the concept of community people have, concept of themselves and their community, and how they actually now relate to cross-curricular um, pardon me, priorities, which means engagement with others, right? And just in this little triangle, you can see very clearly what the curriculum wants you to do, very clearly. So I'll just color it now in some other ways so that we can see things better. So what does the curriculum want you to do? They want you to do projects because projects actually engage the community. Through projects, you engage the community. You might engage students with the local uh, age, residential HK center where children will be actually doing things for the people living there. But as we discuss in on-campus classes, there are ways of doing this, which are actually expansive as opposed to narrowing the community to just the concept, oh, they're just old people there, right? They, they, these people come from different backgrounds and how you actually will construct the whole event depends on how much you actually dare to, what, what kinds of actually materials and what kinds of, um, which members of the community will engage in this event. So we have, so curriculum wants you to create projects which engage the community. They want you to use materials which actually enable children to explore, to, to, to approach the project, to approach the project uh, from the perspective of, uh, from the perspective of the, um, uh, image of the community um, with which they engage. So, so as we were saying in class, so sometimes you can actually um, 
children can create things like even books or cards for older people or even read stories to them and then give them these things actually uh, nicely presented with ornamentation and, and text also taken from Google Translator in different languages and with ornamentation of different languages which they learn through by contact uh, through uh, community members who were contacted by the um, culture officer that's great but you could also actually expand the audience and actually bring other people to the aged care center from different communities and that in this way actually expand in, 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 increase the in, i mean what's the word for it um make this whole event bigger or even not inside of an HK center, or book the bus and do it somewhere in a bigger place. And all the people will have an evening out and they will all lunchtime uh, um, event, which is bigger with different people and in, different, in a different place, quite interesting. So the curr curriculum wants you to do projects, approach the project from the perspective of the image of the community with which they engage to so diversity, which means materials, which actually reflect the, the, the community in which children live. And now, obviously, the curriculum wants you to look at the, at the individual outcomes, but only in the way in which they actually feed back to the capabilities and, to the, and support the project in, in itself, right? So that's the structure. We don't forget we don't forget that and only teach the isolated low level outcomes. We actually have to see that those outcomes can only be learned when we engage with others and we do it in a way so that we actually give justice to the diversity of the community in which we live. Is that difficult? Yes, but this is an academic unit and I have to teach you this how to do it. So now when we actually looked at the, at the work of one of our stu uh, students in our unit, so you can see that that kind of three-way organization, cap uh, which is project, capabilities, and then the outcome, is not visible here. We have a name here. So the so long-term goal, the aim of this lesson is students will be able to examine to examine, um, pardon me, um, literature and recognize reading. That readings include that reading includes more than just reading words and so on. Now that's all good, but everything has to be referenced. And I would have really, really, really preferred if, as long-term goals, we would have actually shown how the uh, pr how, how the, how the uh, con concept of cross-curricular priorities and capabilities actually then link to those outcomes, right? They need to be linked together. And since the engagement lesson actually frames more or less the scope of the entire unit of work, the activities will make possible or make available for students to engage in, in those learning experiences actually have to somehow already set up the context for community construction and f for legitimizing other cultures and for ensuring that all children feel they are on the map, they are included. They may not actually necessarily run and say, I recognize this is the text that my parents use, this kind of characters because they're Japanese or something, but at least they feel they are there on the smart board or they are there in whatever form of materials you use. Now, interestingly, uh, this particular PowerPoint is about um, exploring with children Australian animals. And what was very interesting today, that in class, the student who was present, she also wants to do a, um, oh my God, sorry about that. What I want to do is this, um, that the student wanted also to do animals. And what we have learned today 
that there are ways of doing this, right? So um, if we actually have children in classroom where they um, where they come from different countries and so on, so why we want to explore animals in Australia, it is much more pleasing and much nicer, much more inclusive, much more anything. When we actually look at this, I must have logged in somewhere where they want me now to log in. Um, all right. How, how do I get out of it? Um, all right. Well, I know how to get out of it. We'll just go somewhere else. All right. So anyway. So rather than actually just say this is Australian animals and we are in Australia and all of that, and the person in China says, okay, we always are doing the koala bears, but we've got pandas. And in Poland, they will say, well, we've got a bear that was fighting during the Second World War, but nobody knows about it, but my parents are. But I can't contribute this because we're doing the Australian animals today. Wouldn't it be much lovely, lovelier to actually come to the classroom and at least for the sake of this assignment, to actually say to students, oh, today we've got a puzzle for you. We've got a puzzle. And they go, oh my god, not the puzzle. Yep, today is a puzzle. We're gonna be solving puzzles. And if you create it, and look at this what I was showing today, rather than have three or four animals of different countries uh, or diff different continents and, and then actually create games underneath that engage children and enable them to actually talk about these animals and start actually explaining to each other um, and sharing experiences. A puzzle could also actually have a bit of a problem solving aspect to it. So rather than actually have pictures of animals, which is one way to do it, another way is to use actually the Aboriginal way and Aboriginal people actually use um, uh, footprints. And I found some footprints, was it, you see? And you could actually just even use it, boom, you could use uh, one puzzle with uh, footprints, another puzzle you could use, maybe have a look at how Japanese people actually uh, refer to animals, and maybe some of those um, graphs they use might be so ancient that they actually could be actually reflective of animals. I don't know, you've got to actually have a look, but you can see how this form of teaching challenges you to actually start learning yourselves. We do say it in professional development workshops, we say, oh, well, we teach and we are students ourselves and we learn, but here it is. How the heck are we gonna create a puzzle so that we actually, because since we actually ourselves don't know how to do it, right? So look at this, how many sort of what different, and you, you can actually have a three layer puzzle for each of the, for each of the uh, continents, the puzzle could be three layered. It doesn't have to be the next moment they actually play the activity or they click on something when the truth comes out. There could be a question, there could be some sort of, um, you know, bit more, look for more clues thing like. If you can connect it with reading, by all means, have a look how to do it. I just don't want to have this video, the last video of our class to last for 50 minutes. But you can see what I was saying. So you could actually have a look whether they have it only for Australian animals or whether they have it also, um, they have different footprints for other animals. See what I'm saying? I don't know, do you? Isn't it interesting? We don't know these things. We, we would have never asked ourselves this question had it not been for those capabilities and cross-curricular uh, priorities. They do stretch us. This could be why very often we actually don't work too hard at it because it is just too difficult. Look at this, we've got even a red fox print. Hey, and the red fox is Australian animal. Oh my God. Well, anyway, that's something for someone to resolve. And wouldn't it be nice if children then created a puzzle like this and presented it for people in an aged care center and at the, on the puzzle, they would actually, what they would have, what would they have? Uh, they could actually write the names of the, of, the, of the animals, right? But how would you teach them to write the names of the animals if they can't read? All right. So one of the ways I was saying today in class was to actually, this one, two, three, okay. It doesn't come out very well because, okay, this is better. So remember, this is a, this is the software which is called type, type, this is the one, it's called uh, speech to text, talk typer, talk typer. I don't know whether you can see it, but 
any minute you will because I'm just gonna make it really really big like really big okay so talk typer and you can think it's really stupid and I used to think that too until I started actually playing with it now I'm not sure if I can re recall the entire rhythm of it how I was suggesting to students to do it in class but imagine so this is somewhere here as uh, on the left side they have this thing or anyway they click they click on the microphone which is on the top here and they say um, give permission to use microphone I don't know I'm not using this so allow okay allow and you be begin dictating and you say a cow and then allowing writing in the USA right okay thing is a cow Okay, I'll just do it again and just remove this allow it what well, was it maybe the a US a US thing anyway cow I'm just remove this element was uh, I've, um, anyway but the, the good thing is you play with it and the good thing is that um, English Anyway, cow. You have to wait. There is a thing somewhere here that actually is processing, and then after a while, the word comes out. So anyway, the best thing about this software is that it often, like 80%, it doesn't work. And you'd think, well, why would we want one? Well, because then kids, imagine that it wrote cow. No, it didn't write cow. It wrote uh, cold right imagine it wrote cold not cow so the kid is taking the cow the cold and puts it now i don't like that one and puts it now into the other one here so they type it they look at how it was typed by the computer and then go uh cold and it says cold you can't hear it because I can hear it because it's of uh, the speakers how they are organized and oh my god says something else so they go back and forth back and forth and you think it's a waste of time is it I have spent in school countless hours writing cow 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 for pages that was a waste of time here I am actually doing processing and that's very often what people actually don't appreciate very much about these systems that this is processing so the kid goes back again and, and clicks on microphone and then says cow and then it says something else it will say uh, uh, I don't know house or something similar right anyway so there and they'll go back and forth back and forth back and forth until you actually uh, they may ask you for help they will say that the computer is stupid and that's a very good lesson to learn computers are stupid at least for now but isn't this a more interesting way to do phonics and you would say why Anya I can't remember the example but I'll just give you something that I we have sort of I sort of remember imagine if the computer wrote beer and it was supposed to no, the computer wrote beer and was supposed to be bear so they go to the thing and they type beer they think it's bear right because they compared it they type exactly the letters as, as the other software showed and they click on say it and it says beer and you go oh my god and they all go oh my god something went wrong and you will say well what will we what what went wrong and and kids will say we will remove this letter okay and how's it gonna sound now and it will say b and oh my god wrong letter now this process you might see like um, lengthy not as lengthy as writing for 300 pages a, let, a, a word cow right but but hold it um, students are working individually on the sounds they hear they type it's like phonics but it's a 21st century phonics right and they work out which letters to remove in order to get the right letter uh, correct in the right place right and they type it they not just click and repeat click and repeat and what do you think and blah, 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 blah. this is like oh my god I want it right because that once I get the word right and I get the bear right so the kids will copy it or type it 
I mean, they can even type, write it by hand because they'll be so excited. They'll take your PowerPoint where the animal is, and this is, let's imagine this is a bear, some, you know, who knows? Anyway, and they will just paste it or type it bear or lion. And that will be the first slide. Uh, so lion or bear for the little PowerPoint that they're going to present at the HK Center, right? We've got the first slide done. A lion, a lion, a lion, a lion, a lion. Oh my God, this is so exciting. So what we will do now, we'll, we'll select this lion and then we will go to, oh my God. We will go somewhere where it's insert the object. Remember, uh, I'm not going to do it because I lose the screen. Oh, I have done it already. All right, so there's somewhere uh, insert, then media, and then audio, and record the audio, and they'll say, yeah, a lion. Thank you very much. And typically it would have recorded itself, but I don't know where it is. So as an older person clicks here, the, the word lion will come up. I don't know where it went, by the way. But anyway, you get my point. So we started first with what? We started with segregation and ra cultural and ra racial segregation, and that ain't any good. And we, we also pointed out that people do it subconsciously, not knowing it. And, it, and part of us being teachers is not to learn how to actually uh, it's not to learn how to design units of work or lessons. Part of that, of us being a teacher, or most important part is to actually be sensitized to the fact that we do these unpleasant things, where are they here? And that we have to actually be aware of not to do it. And one of the ways of not to do it is to ensure that as soon as we design our unit, the first thing here we put in is those, is those curricular uh, priorities and capabilities. And the way we design uh, if already the first lesson is such that we will know that we are creating activities that actually are about engaging children with the, in, into a project by, for, with the community and through particular outcomes that will actually make this and this possible, right? And the technology bit I showed you because I thought it was fun and it showed you how you can actually use simple techniques to do something like a project, like a um, little um, interactive um, slideshow for older people with children who are preliteracy, using all the phonics beliefs without actually making it boring and reducing the entire task to just children, please repeat, please, please repeat, please repeat activities. So that's what I wanted to summarize with. I'm sure that I missed things and I'm sure that I could have done this PowerPoint, uh, this uh, class today better, but that pretty much emotionally for me uh, summarizes the entire unit. So thank you very much for being in this unit, for putting up in it for the last 12 weeks. I had an amazing time with you. If anybody, looks at the production of yours and, and what do they do with it um hmm. so where do you think we are we would be here and our discussion board i mean our discussion board is just a testimony testimony to your work unbelievable unbelievable we have three pages of 25 postings on each page and look at this, 17 students, 18 students having conversation, four students, and here, this is a submission time. We have only two, one, three, 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 because people are already finalizing their submissions. But look at this. That's just amazing, the sharing. And I want to thank you for that, because you have been amazing, an amazing group. So thank you very much. I'll just remove this. I don't know how to remove it. Anyway. So um, thank you very much for being in this unit and thank you very much for your wonderful, wonderful thoughts and wonderful collaboration. And I really, really, really wish you all the best in your journey to become a teacher. Thank you very much.